All right. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everyone who's joining us from near and far. My name is Peter D. Trump. I'm Vice President of Heart Hanks Client Services. This is the first of a series of webinars sponsored by Heart Hanks that we are calling From Care to Caring. I have a great panel joining me today. We will make some introductions in just a minute or two, but um, let me at least introduce them by name and company and title. So Claire Woodward is joining us from the UK, Relative Insights. Claire is head of the, is director of the client success. Zach Nelson is joining us from the West Coast. Zach is vice president of strategy for Hard Hanks. Myra Rios is joining us from Austin. Myra is the social media manager for Hard Hanks. I'm going to, um, ask everyone to give a brief introduction as we start our first question of the day. And that is, how do you define ROI within a social media setting? So anybody wanna raise your hand and take that first? Myra, how about you? Yeah, definitely. Um, as Peter said, I am the social media manager for Heart Hanks. Um, I work with our agents here to ensure that we are speaking as the brand that we're representing. Um, for me, the beauty of ROI with social is that it isn't limited. So ROI for social is pulling insight from interactions to learn about customers' needs and to use that knowledge to deliver a better experience. Um, because ultimately improving the customer experience leads to retention of old customers and acquisition of new customers since people tend to shop reviews prior to making purchases. So, um, and I'll go ahead and pass. All right, Claire, how about yourself? Perfect, cheers. Yeah, um, so I'm the Customer Success Director at Relative Insight. Um, we're a text analytics tool that looks at any sort of text content, no matter the format. Um, I myself worked in analytics for just over 10 years in customer care. So I've seen it kind of evolve from being voice only to it being social and channel of choice for every customer. For me, I define ROI as based on how successfully a brand responds to those customer needs, how many contacts are addressed first time without a need to interact with another customer care function, um, how well you actually push out your content, your customer base, your listening all the time, identifying a trend or resolution, and what otherwise would push you through into the voice channels and the more expensive sort of contacts. That's fantastic, Claire. And I know in a little while you're going to talk more about relative insights and some of the comparative analysis that you do, not just between brands, but in an industry itself. So we'll look forward to circling back with you shortly. Zach, uh, when you think about ROI, you live it every day across all of the channels that you're developing strategy, but what does it mean specifically in social media? Yeah, so uh, it's a great question, Peter. And I think this is one of those that comes down to um, a, a brand objective or objectives because social media, the beauty of it is that it can cover everything and it's rather unique in that regard. Um, you know, it's um, a brand awareness tool and it can be measured, ROI can be measured in terms of reach uh, via, via shares. Um, it's a brand lead gen tool that can, you know, where a metric could be based on uh, cost per lead or numbers of leads generated. Um, it's a nurturing tool and conversion tool to sales. And of course, as um, everybody knows on this call, it's a, it's a customer service tool. So um, the way that I actually have grown to love social the most my, personally in terms of ROI is um, what kind of surprising insight, how many surprising or um, unexpected insights can you draw from what you're hearing through social interactions that allows you to do something that fundamentally changes the trajectory of a brand or helps um, a brand evolve. Um, those are those are not so common. Those metrics uh, are in the probably, you know, on one hand, usually uh, per year, but they can be incredibly valuable. And we'll talk more about that a little bit later. Fantastic. You know, you all touched on the three parts of social media and social media marketing, right? Social community, social listening, and social care. And part of our objective today is to walk the audience through that, what it means to um, clients that we serve or folks that we see within the social media landscape. And we've, we've developed that path along 
four R's, and they are review, relate, resolve, and refrain. So we're, the next few minutes, we're going to walk through some of those points, and we're going to talk about what it means in the social media community, listening, and care when it comes to reviews. So Myra, when you think about reviews, um, you live this every day. You work with clients. You, you are a consumer. You, I'm sure, leave online reviews as well. How do you monitor and engage um, the community within social media reviews? Yeah, I mean, I think the best way to go about it is really understanding that um, the interactions you have on social um, it's a special opportunity to really meet the customers where they're at and where they feel the most comfortable. Um, it's often the place that you get the most genuine thoughts and feelings on how they're feeling about whatever the product or service is. So um, if it's really going beyond just, you know, when you think of social traditionally, you think of the posts and the images that you're doing, but this is going beyond the posts. This is going and finding the value in the interactions that you're able to have. Um, if you, I mean, 76% of consumers who purchase a product, they purchase it based on someone else's re, uh, recommendation. So um, when you think of recommendations, that's also including going in and checking reviews before you purchase a product. Um, we even have a case study that um, revolves around our, um, one of our appliance, uh, one of our leading appliance um, customers. And we were able to actually um, look at these reviews and instead of just acknowledging them and um, telling them, you know, it's all gonna be okay, we actually find a solution for them. And once we're able to find a solution, there's actually companies that will either remove those negative rev reviews or even have the customer go in and, actually alter those reviews to show their full customer experience because it doesn't end at the buying process. There's still that experience that you have with the product after the fact. So um, reviews, kind of like I said before in my introduction, reviews can be used to really develop a better process with your customers and um, grow from that. It's interesting because I think a lot of consumers look at reviews as being an unmovable force. They are what they are, and yet the best in class brands are engaging and responding to reviews. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that when we get down to relate and how we relate to the consumer, whether or not they're just posting in general or they're or they're providing a review itself. Claire, when you think about um, your landscape at Relative Insights and the ability to mine uh, so much text across the digital landscape. Uh, talk a little bit about what that means to hear and relate to what the chatter is within social media. Yeah, it was just one of the points that like in what Myra was saying that the idea of we have, we tell people if we have a bad experience. It's that idea of if you have a bad experience, you're gonna tell everybody. So what we realize is that old adage of for every good experience, we tell one person, for every bad experience, we tell 10. And actually the reality is it takes 40 good reviews to undo the damage that one bad review can do. Sat Matrix, who we all know as the NPS kind of leader, went into this and went, well, what's the monetary value? And like a good review, you can add maybe $816, depending on the exchange rate, um, to what the price is. But in return, a negative review can easily wipe out 1,352 because that's the sort of money that people will not continue to purchase. For us at Relative, we're key to like looking at what everybody's saying, no matter what the source is. But sometimes it's more interesting to listen to where you wouldn't expect to listen. So we all know that people go to Twitter to complain, but actually are we looking in those review sites where consumers are actually looking um, at this time? What we actually find is that you need to be looking at not just yourself, but your entire com and like competitive landscape. And actually, it can become really overwhelming as a brand to kind of think, well, where do we start? Um, and so what we find when we're looking at how well brands kind of respond to what customers are saying is we look to see, well, who does it well and who does it badly? And what we find is that brands are definitely trying to tailor their messaging. They are trying to move away from 
a one size kind of fits all. And they're trying to be more customer centric and more kind of style like the customer. But actually what we find is a simple post on social media can actually become viral and actually go because for the really the wrong reasons. They missed the mark completely because they actually were not listening to what customers were saying in the wider parts of the internet. And so actually they made a claim, they pushed out a message and actually that wasn't the consistent feeling for everybody. They were kind of going, actually, I'm not having that experience and I'm going to contact your brand. And actually it, what we find is sometimes better to be tone deaf to what customers are actually experiencing than actually going over what it is and brush over it, than try to push a message out that doesn't kind of marry up to what everyone's saying. That's really interesting. So you're saying that um, a best practice might be to acknowledge good and bad reviews, but how you acknowledge it is so critical. And then the fact that if you're not connected with the overall brand, the value of the brand, the market the perception of the brand, you're better off not responding at all. Is that what you say? It's sometimes if you're going to put out a message or a piece of comms, that's actually not what everybody experiences. At times it can be better to hold back and then maybe try to tailor it or ensure that it goes right on the right channel. So if your Instagram channel doesn't have that same sort of experience, but your Twitter channel does, then that's the one you focus on because you, what you don't want to do is disengage consumer base who may be already slightly disengaged already. Claire, one of the things that um, we see a lot in our marketing services group is this disconnect between the, uh, what, a, what a brand feels its image is and what the market is reflecting or um, how they're perceiving that brand. Can you just talk a little bit about that and, and maybe some of the things that you see in terms of, of that disconnect and how it plays on social media? Yeah, um, where we really are starting to see it is the use of bots on social um, a lot more. We used to see them a lot in live chat. And what businesses are actually trying to do is show that they are responding to your needs. They're using a very generic response. Um, but the problem is when that's going in at potentially the wrong time, especially when it's an emotionally charged problem that the consumer is facing, if those are not being addressed, when a customer does reach out to your brand, and they get a generic response and it comes from a bot, actually you've, you've added an additional layer to that customer and they've added another problem for them that they don't necessarily want to fall into. And sometimes what we see is businesses going, I'm not going to respond to it this way, I'm gonna take it offline. So go from being online and visible to everyone to see, to being more of a, we'll kind of do this behind closed doors, but actually what we're trying to do is address the issue, resolve that customer in the best way possible, and then put steps in place to be better at it for the next customer who comes through the doors. That's interesting. And in the future, we'll talk a little bit about some of the technology underlying those responses. Um, but what comes to mind when you talk about that bot is how connected it is to the customer care um, economy and ecosystem. And if it's not, it just inflames the, the response and the reaction. Zach, do you have any thoughts in terms of, Claire just talked a lot about uh, perception and strategy within the marketplace. How do you interpret or relate to what Claire was just talking about? Yeah, I think I, I, such a such a great point she's making. And um, of course, these you know, there's a one to one aspect of being responsive and relating to um, you know individual concerns in, in you know particularly keeping in mind how damaging um, a single bad review can be, how detrimental, um, and finding a way of, of authentically and specifically addressing um, that, uh, that deficiency, um, and, you know, to offset some of the negativity of, um, of a bad review. And that, of course, you know, that should be done, monitored carefully. Um, but I think what's also interesting to think about um, is Having seen um, a bad review or a pattern uh, in, in uh, negative reviews that may reveal something that, um, you know, really is a problem that needs to be addressed. It's not just an individual's, um, one, one customer's experience. Um, it's some, there's a deficiency in the brand experience. That's when it becomes very interesting because there are ways of um, developing content um, and interactions in other channels. Uh, through other means that might head off some of that negative experience in the first place, or changing something um, about the product itself, 
or the onboarding experience, um, you know, and orienting someone, a new customer that might help avoid uh, that negative experience in, in the first place. So that's for, for somebody like me in, in designing brand experiences and, and customer experience programs um, uh, where I find the, the nuggets the, and so much value in, in social. So that was a great segue into the third R, which is to resolve. Right, so we've 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 read the reviews. We're relating to the market, to the consumer sentiments, and now there's some action that needs to be taken. Um, Myra, again, you live this every day, both in terms of the general social chatter, but also in reviews. Do you want to talk a little bit about, or would you talk a little bit about resolving um, complaints, concerns, and issues that go across the social media landscape? Yeah, definitely. And I think uh, Zach led into that really well, because um, I, I know this feels obvious, but the best way to resolve is to really know your product and know the service you're offering. And the best way to learn about that product and that service that you're offering is to really listen to the type of feedback that you're getting back and to really be able to understand, like, if there is a common trend that we're seeing, what can we do to keep evolving and keep resolving with it? So um yeah i think and we all pretty much touched on it um but just to like dig into it a little bit deeper but being specific being um specific about what the customer is asking or, or telling you you know they're saying it one way but they could easily be saying i just need help i need troubleshooting i want this to work i bought this because i wanted it to work so what can we do to get me to that point um so um and really understanding where to resolve the problem. It's not even just about resolving it, but if it's something that's going to be um, requiring a little bit more information or requiring a little bit more interaction one on one, it's better to take that conversation off of the public forum and resolve it within a direct message. So taking your customer and telling them we'd love to help you, please you know, meet us in the direct messages so that we can have this conversation and get the get this solution for you because we want it to work for you just as much as you do. <laughs> so I think that shows up in a couple of different places, right? We've all read the complaints about the airline passenger who's been stranded at the airport and um, maybe as a last resort, although I'm not sure that people actually use it, it might become a first resort these days. They'll go to social media. And, and the airlines are quick to take them into a private message. They'll, they'll acknowledge the problem and then they'll invite them to a private message. Myra, talk a little bit about what goes on with that, um, within the, the direct messaging aspect of it. What are you trying to help brands do once they take somebody into that conversation? Yeah, I mean, it's it's really about building building that trust with the customer and building that um, that level of communication where they can give you the information you need. And this also goes back to understanding your product because if you understand your product, then you know how to find the solution and what information you need to get to get that solution. So pulling them into the direct message is really about um, getting the information we need to be able to pr provide a customer with like, the right solution and um, troubleshoot the way that they'll need because um, you know it could be some sort of common issue, but it could even be maybe maybe there's something else that we need to do. Maybe it's because you're operating on a phone instead of a laptop, or maybe you're using the wrong web browser, or maybe there's just a better way to clean this product so that you're not having the issues that you're having. Like whatever, whatever it is, the reason we bring them into the private message is so that we can really dive into their specific solution. And again, get very like into the grain with the customer, with that individual and have that conversation because like we were saying, it's with with social, it's important to um, pull away from the automated, pull away from the, um, you know, responses that look very robotic. We want to have that one on one engagement. And the best way to do that is to go into that private message and create this sort of like repertoire back and forth, um, but also be as like straight direct to the point with them so that we can find that solution and get them going. <laughs> 
Uh, thank you for that. It's, it's interesting because what we've learned is that um, social media shouldn't be on an island in and of itself. You know, we've, I think we've all agreed, or we would all agree that it's evolved from the intern to more of a, of a critical marketing and customer care function within organizations. But there's a, there's a loop back into things like product design and product enhancement that's important too. So not taking these um, concerns as, as a one-off, but actually building a better um, experience, a better product resulting from that. Zach, I'm gonna, I'm gonna turn to you because we're, we're kind of starting into that refrain area right now, right? So we, we reviewed, we related, we helped resolve. And, and by the way, we're gonna circle back to resolve again, um, Claire with you. But when you think about the bigger picture, Zach, of taking that um, online community beyond just um, social care, what does that mean to you? And how do you help your clients achieve that? Yeah, I think that's, yeah, this, my, this is my favorite part um, and I, why I, part of the reason why I, I love what I do. Um, I, and if you think of it as a human being, um, you know, think about your own family and um, how you approach, um, you know, uh, issues. You know, do, do you look at the relative whose opinion differs, who's complaining about something, um, you know, uh, 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 has an opinion uh, and say that person's crazy. What they don't know what they're talking about and disengage. Um, or do you say, all right, I might disagree somewhat um, and they're, they might be eccentric or quirky, but you know what? They actually have a point um, about it and, and genuinely try to meet them where they are and say, maybe, maybe I can learn from it. Because um, I think that, uh, you know, it's very easy as folks who um, manage brands and love the brands that they manage, <laughs> um, there are babies, to, um, you know, look at uh, customer uh, interactions, especially negative ones, as, um, you know, burden and a problem that uh, you'd rather see go away um, and, and not have to deal with uh, than... Um, wonderful gifts <laughs> and nuggets that you can use to improve your brand or um, or help you to rethink something that, um, you, you know, in our insular worlds uh, of living these brands every day, we may not see. Um, so I think when, when you think about reframing, um, it's that, you know, it's exactly that type of psychological um, approach of starting from, I can learn, this is positive, this is okay, and it's going, and, and it can help me. So I want to give you a few examples in the form of case studies, if, if we have a few minutes, that, um, that, that might help bring this to light. Um, take a uh, pandemic, um, the beginning March, April, or May of 2020. Um, the, you know, we didn't know what, uh, how COVID was spread uh, as much as we do today. Uh, that it's much more you know, respiratory and, and air circulation and breathing issue than it is touching things um, and, and uh, contracting the virus that way. Well, I, you know, it's, I remember spraying and wiping down, um, uh, you know, and um, hand sanitizers all the time. So uh, uh, Lysol, um, they are the authority um, on uh, things that protect us from uh, in, in environmental contagions. That's, that is their brand, but you couldn't get it. Shelves were empty, um, kind of like, you know, they were, they were the parallel to toilet paper. Um, and for Lysol, um, you know, not being able to access a product that people thought was critical to their survival was quite upsetting. Um, so there was a lot of negative sentiment building up um, around the fact that people could not uh, get the, the product. Um, and what we tried to do was to help them understand that, you know what, this is actually um, an opportunity for you. It's not, it's not necessarily a, a negative um, because it's not as though Lysol was not trying to produce more. They were actually canceling production lines of other less critical products in favor of making more Lysol. But obviously these things take time to retool, find the, you know, work their way onto, onto shelves. 
in the meantime, what an opportunity for a brand to take those that, that negative feedback. And while, of course, you want to reassure individuals who are complaining, it's coming, don't worry, um, and handling it from a customer care perspective, you, why not turn that around? Turn the camera around, show what the, in, the human beings in the factories are doing to correct the situation, get, create content um, that, you, that you push out to help people understand that Lysol is actually on your side, that they're trying to help. Um, and, and, it's on, and help is on its way, though it might take longer than you might, um, than you might wish it did. Um, so that's just one example of how you might pivot and reframe um, a, uh, what, what seems like negative uh, feedback reviews um, or, or um, a negative customer care experience into a positive brand experience. Thank and, you, and, and I think we, we had plenty of evidence during the pandemic of how companies initially struggled in reframing the dialogue and reframing the communication. And now they found more of a cadence, um, certainly two years into the pandemic. Claire, let me ask, along the lines of reframing, you have some phenomenal reporting that you give back to your clients to kind of show and highlight the, um, uh, the disconnect that might exist between the brand and their community, or even within the industry and its community. Just talk a little bit about the deliverable from relative insights related to really helping the most progressive clients move forward in social media. Yeah, um, we've been we've worked with a lot of clients on this to try and improve one their social strategy, but additionally, we've also been looking at helping on their self serve area. One of the things we associate with customers when they have to get in contact with a customer care team is the effort that's involved from their perspective, that high effort, the more effort and more steps that customer has to go through can become quite difficult, which is why social is somewhat seen as a kind of a quick fix or a quick answer. And it's always seen as quite a negative. It's that idea of you only get complaints or you get your issues come through there. But what we were wanting to do, they were working on their self-serve area. And when we looked at it initially, it was very business driven. It was all high tech terminology. It wasn't customer centric. What we actually took was all of their open source contact, any contact that went into their business and anything that went into their community. And now the reason we took their community was for the reason being is they have advocates in there who are speaking customer language. They're speaking in a way that the customers want to speak, but they're also providing a resolution. <clears throat> so by taking something that's naturally seen as problematic, it's something we don't want to get into, you can take something and completely turn it on its head then use that to design a self-care strategy that customers then can do themselves in their own time and they may never need to interact with your brand apart from your website. So what we're actually saying is by taking something that can be a negative, do something that say a brand, a customer doesn't expect your brand to do because they've seen historically you've not done something, actually your customer's more likely to stick with you because you're actually identifying a problem before they've got there because you're using what everyone else is saying to build your bit, your bigger communication strategy. Well, that's fantastic. And I think that really does suit the last of our R's, which is reframe. Um, I should have said it earlier. If you have questions, feel free to put it into the chat. We already have a couple of questions and we'll spend a few minutes um, on questions and then we'll wrap up here. So um, the first question has to do with tools and um, both listening and responding tools. Uh, Myra, is there a tool that you recommend or how do you work within um, various tool sets? Yeah, I think, so for me, the best way to choose a tool that fits with your brand is to figure out like what KPIs are important for your brand. Um, what kind of things you're trying to do with social media. Um, and what kind of things are important for you to monitor? I think I'm I'm so I'm very familiar and very comfortable and obviously a big fan of uh, Sprinkler and Hootsuite. I use those two a lot. Um, I feel like Hootsuite is very user friendly, so it's a it's a good one whenever you're um, you know trying to find a good monitoring tool. Sprinkler has a lot of data behind it. So I'm, I'm a big fan of that one whenever you're wanting to look at numbers and really um, see, see what type of stuff goes into, um, happens in the background of your social, not just the out, 
outgoing part, but the ingoing part, the data that comes back. So, so there are some marquee tools out there. There are tools being developed every day to help us. Um, oh, yeah. Everything from the listening to the responding. Claire, we had a question regarding um, your comment about when not to respond to a social media conversation. The question has to do with how do you how do you educate or teach a company to have that instinct on when to respond and when not to respond? Yeah, um, having been there and been on enterprise trying to figure out what's the what's the topic you're going after. I am, when it's when you're firefighting, it's really hard to figure out where to go and you kind of just take whatever's the biggest negativity, what's driving it. But actually, when you get a chance to kind of step back and look at what's actually been going on, it's actually worth looking to see what hasn't changed. Not necessarily what's constantly kind of fluctuating, but it's the idea of, well, what's that constant, really small, minor thing that actually may be having an impact on my negative score? And actually, it's a constant thing, but it's small. And what you may start to see is it's linked to a seasonality. It's a product launch or you're not being agile enough to adapt to what the customer is. I think there's a need to focus on whatever's burning, track what's coming in, what, what's changing, what's going on. But when you do have some time and it's calm, it's actually just come back a little bit and go, well, what's always there and what can we do as a business to move those customers depending on their channel of choice? So is it a social thing? Is it a voice? Is it live chat? Where does it need to be? And then tailor it so that when that does change, people have a positive experience and they do start to talk about it and share your brand. Good, thank you. Um, Zach, we had a question regarding um, reframing the strategy from, from customer care. I had an issue, I expressed my concern um, socially. It's, it's been resolved. How did we turn that into more of a loyalist or even um, expand and grow the opportunity to uh, acquire new customers? Yeah. And I would, I would love to pose a, a question um, because I think this is a, a hidden opportunity for brands um, I, that I want to crack the code on, on, on this um, because I believe that it's quite possible um, to take a detractor, um, someone who's had a negative experience, and based on the resolution of that negative experience, um, there, you know, it's not everybody. There are people, you know, for whom re resolving their uh, their issue, it's just a table stake. And and uh, thank you very much. And, and um, that's the least you could do for me. There are other people um, for whom resolving um, a pain point. Um, it, you know, it, it is, they're so grateful <laughs> uh, that you took the time to do, to, you know, to help them through. They're so grateful to the brand for what it did to, uh, you know, in general, that um, these people could in turn be enlisted um, and they can be uh, used by a brand as a, a, a micro influencer. Um, and then, you know, the most obvious um, pivoting and turning, reframing would be, um, you know, to encourage a review. Uh, that form of advocacy, but I actually wonder if if you could go beyond that. Um, could you take that person and actually, you know, help them um, spread the word even more? And I'm thinking, you know, there that gets maybe into could they be um, an ambassador through a testimonial, um, you know, and, and uh, share their their experience that way. So I would challenge brands, you know, as far as, you know, having certain standards around the way that you respond to customer concerns um, and issues that are that are raised via social on an individual basis. You know, could, could you take that person and make them truly into an advocate of, of your brand? That's, you know, and that's a very individual approach. Um, but the other answer to this question comes in, in um, a, a more general pivot. Um, and I want to give you another e example to show you um, what I mean, because I think these are best expressed through case studies. Um, healthcare uh, is, is a challenging uh, industry, managed care, I should say. So either your healthcare, your health insurance provider, um, often reviled. Um, you know, the source of great frustration for people. Um, there are often, uh, you know, costs that you don't expect. You, there are often um, uh, provider uh, network challenges. You can't see the doctor you want to see when you want to see him or her. So, um, you know, uh, when we see 
um, concerns, you know, get to a certain level and, and identify the patterns in the feedback uh, from customers, that's when you begin to say, you know what, I, I think that the, we might have um, a problem with the way we orient customers. I, I alluded to this earlier, but this is a very, you know, here's a specific example in healthcare. Can you do a better job of setting people's expectations around cost sharing? As an example, in, in you know, we all have co-insurance and deductibles um, and co-pays that we, we personally deal with that I'm sure we don't like. Um, you know, and it, but nothing is worse than not knowing that you are going to have these costs surface. So we should be able to do a better job of preparing people that there are these different types of cost sharing, um, you know, the things that exist and when you can expect them and how much um, in you know, at the beginning of a relationship. Likewise, you should be able to take people who are switching um, from one insurance provider to another to help them find, if not the provider that they were are, are accustomed to seeing, the exact doctor or facility, but help them find the facility or, or, or doctor specialist that would do just as good a job, um, you know, as opposed to letting them figure that out entirely by themselves. And when we've done those kinds of things for in, in the managed care uh, sphere, uh, we've seen significant um, in improvements in tenure, reductions in churn um, on the other side. So, um, you know, those are a couple of examples. There's an individual type of reframing that I just, you know, I mentioned through um, reviews, testimonials, and, and um, building advocates out of critics. And then there's looking for the patterns in uh, the macro and changing something about the way that uh, you proactively try to shape people's expectations to head off issues later. You know, it's, that's a, a, an excellent way to kind of end this first webinar from care to caring. Um, I love the term you use, micro-influencers. Um, I'm familiar with a number of brands, some of which um, we've worked directly with, who create this kind of community of raving fans based upon a very positive. So not all social media needs to be negative. Of course, in, in, in customer care, oftentimes we think we're on the receiving or we see we're on the receiving end of that. But there's also the opportunity to amplify the voice of the most um, satisfied customers. And, and I think each one of you touched on that today. So um, I'm sorry if we didn't get to all of the questions. We will try to respond to you directly if possible. Um, I'd like to thank our panel, Claire and Zach and Myra, for participating to do today and doing a great job of kind of sharing insights into social media community, social media listening, and the social media care aspect. Um, on the screen, we have our contact information. If you have any questions or comments regarding the content of today's presentation, please reach out to us. If you'd like to um, share with us maybe your strategy or your calculations of a return on investment for social media, we'd love to hear from you. So reach out to any one of us and we'd love to set up some time and just brainstorm with you and, Part of the Hart Hanks DNA is to share best practices. And so we do that very freely. We're happy to do that with anyone uh, in the audience today that would be interested in that. So thank you all very much. We'll, we'll schedule our second from Care to Caring event uh, shortly. I appreciate the time you've given us today and I hope everyone has a wonderful rest of the day. Thank you. <laughs>